Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of This Is Mapa Cypriot Football Podcast. Another show, another episode full of shenanigans, as you'd expect from the Brodathlim. I'm Stel, I've got Kiri here. How are you doing, Giragomu? I'm good, Stel, how are you? Yeah, all good, all good. Another little bout of COVID in the family, which has put... Christmas to a grinding halt, but to be fair, mate, I'm not a fan of this time of year. So, is it really a big loss? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sorry to hear about the health problems. I, I hope it's nothing too too serious. But yeah, uh, if yeah, if you're not in in if you if you're not if you're not into Christmas, then I guess uh, kind of like dodging the the big meetup can't be the worst thing in the world. Exactly, exactly. And look, I've got no problem with me and up with family, but sometimes, you know, we just can't, not that you can't be bothered, but it's like, fuck me, man. Yeah, I get it. There we go. All right, mate. Well, look, let's get right into this, man. And it, as I said, it's been an eventful uh, weekend as ever with the Brother Thilima. I did a show last week. Um, on my own because obviously we all had our own work commitment so we couldn't work around it and the the first game I'd like to discuss right here is um, Bayek getting a draw away against Aris Aris who won last week convincingly against your boys but they struggled against Bayek and even though um, Bambigo scored twice last week had a great opportunity at the, at the beginning uh, there was a goal disallowed from uh, Stepinski, Stepinski for offside I bet Stepinski yeah but offside, and that was a clear offside. There's, there's no complaints here. But unsu- well, a big surprise was Bayek going ahead. A shot from well outside the box. And Vanna, who's been absolutely superb since joining Aris in the summer, let that go right through his hands. Butterfingers, as they like to call him. A guy that's went, went seven consecutive games without conceding, over 270 minutes without conceding, and then he did this. But this was an even bigger mistake <laughs> by Prosek, the goalkeeper, who's on loan from Ael. What a clangor that was. And um, a goal from Sikorsky. Now, this went to VAR for some reason. I, I was watching it time and time again, and I thought, well, what was the problem? Because originally I saw that the cross came in and it came off the defender's head. Now, obviously, they had to clarify whether it came off the defender's head or not. But even watching it from that angle, you know it comes off the defender's head. So I don't know why it took so long for VAR to decide that it was a goal. But, hey, it counted. Unfortunately for Iris, they couldn't get... Another one, and that was it. One apiece. Um, now, Aris, after the game against you guys, was singing about winning the title. Their fans were talking about Laos <laughs> and this and that. And look, this is a club that's come up. They've done remarkably well since coming in, in, back into the Pradathlima. They spent wisely. They've made some very uh, interesting uh, movements in the transfer market. And apparently, they're going to be spending big in January. But in terms of a draw against Bayek. It's no shame, don't get me wrong, but you'd expect them to get the three points, no? Yeah. Um, since we're on the topic of Aris, before I get into the game, I just wanted to uh, commend the, you know, the people in, in the board because I I heard a, a story where the new chairman, I don't know if that's officially his position or the, the new investor in any case, um, without warning or without telling them beforehand, um, paid for a lot of the academy kids, uh, shin guards, shoes, equipment, um, on the day of when they were supposed to pay for them. So um, it was a very nice little surprise. And this is verified from, from someone um, in the know. So... Yeah, well done to them for that. And more clubs should be doing this. They spend obscene amounts of money on players who feature three times a season and then they leave. So I'm sure they'll have they have 500 euros to pay for for some kids, you know, equipment. Cigarette money, frappe and, money. And stuff. So anyway, um, got that out of the way. Uh, definitely, uh, hang on, not, not uh, the Aris, yeah, 
Uh, I was going to say, I was uh, telling you before the show that it's been raining here for the last uh, week or two. Everyone's just lost their mind a little bit. So I thought, to be honest, to make excuses for him, but yeah, it was it was a, it was a decent shot actually from from a bit way out. Uh, but yeah, on Aris's goal, initially when when the flag went up, uh, my in my first instinct was, isn't there? A, and, and I was a little bit vague about this, but. Um, isn't there a rule about when the keeper comes out, the the, the offside line goes with him or something like that? Do you know? Uh, yeah, it's like this weird... yeah, this this rule I've never thought... quite understood. I've never quite understood that part of the offside rule. But then again, they changed the offside rule so many times. How can you keep up yeah. with it? I don't even think the referees can keep yeah. up with it. Yeah. Uh, and then, okay, they, they said fairly quickly... Uh, in the commentary that uh, it's related to whether it hit the the head of the defender or the attacker. But yeah, Adis weren't really good. And to be honest, I, I think we might have overpraised Stabinski in the first few rounds because he's not been the same player. Um, granted, people have been scoring around him, which is what you kind of want. But um, yeah, he's, he's not been... Uh, uh, as productive as he he started off uh, the season. And um, you, you mentioned the uh, potential artist new owner or the new chairman uh, buying shin pads and everything for the for the youngsters. I've got a friend who's who's a university teacher, and he was telling me that one of his students is in the Addis Academy, and they promoted him to the first team for a game last week or the week before. I can't remember. And uh, he said that they got on the coach. And it wasn't this old banger. It was like a 300,000 euro coach with Wi-Fi, with USB ports, with everything in there. And I'm thinking, the, from going one end of the island to the other, it's only like an hour, an hour and a half. Why do you need such a massive coach for something like this? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I, I, think, um, I think it might be, you know, I think he's trying to make the club attractive. Keep in mind that uh, next season, Ayel Abolon and Aris are moving to a brand new, brand spanking new stadium. Uh, it just changes the dynamic of all three clubs, but Aris, like, okay, Abolon and Ayel obviously are going to see a rise in season ticket sales and, and all that stuff, but they, they already had, you know, a sizable amount of fans. But for Aris... If they go, if they go from averaging a hundred tickets a game from three four years ago to a thousand or one point five, that's like a one thousand percent rise or twelve hundred percent rise. It's 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 very different. So the the things like the coach, I think it just cha changes the type of play that the new uh, man um, chairman wants to attract to the club. Obviously, there's cash there. But there's no, sorry, Aris, but there's no prestige. There's, and I'm not saying that other Cypriot clubs necessarily have prestige as well, but it's a, it's a bit different for a, a club that kind of like yo-yos between the first and the second division. So it's interesting to see how they, they move uh, in the next uh, year or two. They're definitely staying up. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. And with that financial backing, it's very difficult to... Uh to say that there'll be relegation contenders next season. I can't see it personally because they're definitely going to strengthen uh, in the summer, even in January, yeah. even in January. Well, look, let's move on to the next game. And it's uh, Mayo Monia who lost 2-1 at Doxa. Uh, how we lost, I know, <laughs> with just poor defending, as you can see from uh, the first goal from Sadiq. Um, we had some chances... Uh, Shepa had a header which went wide. Um, there was also an opportunity for Johnny's, but this was the equaliser. Lovely cross from Dura uh, and a smashed in from Johnny's after Shepa nodded it down. And going into the second half, I thought, you know what? If we're going 1 1 at half time or even at 2 1 up, we'll win this at a canter. But what Jan Lesiax was doing here to concede the penalty is beyond me. He's lost the ball. He's pushed the, the winger over. When he was going to the byline, he wasn't going anywhere. And you're not going to bet against uh, Sadiq scoring. I think that was his eighth goal of the season. And a shock defeat for Omoni. I guess it was justice for Doxa, who had two goals disallowed 
in the uh, the game at the Ghazi B at the beginning of the season. But there were two big missed opportunities at the end of this game. Um, in fact, let me see if I can, I've got it. I don't even know if I've got it. Here we go. Here we, there's EI who was one-on-one with the keeper, shot straight at the keeper. And then this chance from Botiak, which was even worse of a miss. Great ball there. But on the edge of the six-yard box, you're expecting him to put that away. And, you know, I was talking to Roy after the, the game. We did the No Choftes podcast. And I said, if you don't take your chances... It doesn't matter if you create 10, 15, 20 clear-cut opportunities and your, your opponents have one and they score and you don't score. You don't deserve to win. It doesn't matter how many chances. If you don't take them, you don't deserve to win. And that was the story of Omonio. Henningberg said there were strange goals that they conceded, but let's be 100% honest. The type of goals that Omonio have conceded this season, it has become a characteristic of them. And I was absolutely livid with, um, with the lack of finishing, the... the, the the poor finishing and the defending as well. Now, Kiri, listen, we've spoken about um, many clubs in Cyprus ball watching and the standard of defending being so poor. But from Omonia being so good last season, keeping, was it 17 clean sheets in the last 20 games to this? Where do you think it's gone wrong, mate? Uh, I mean, we I know we've touched on this before and I, I'm sure the... The answer is is a bit more complicated than you know than a lot of fans might think, uh, rival fans or or Ammonia fans. We know it when something like this happens. Uh, I mean, if it was easy, you know, someone like Henningberg would have addressed it by now. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I mean, just to quickly uh, add to what you said about the game because I was watching it as well. I couldn't believe what I was watching, uh, mostly in terms of. Omonia's uh, attacking because you created some of the highest uh, percentage chances I've seen in the league this season. And to miss one, okay, fine. It's it's one, it happens. But three, four of them, it, it was very, and it was, and it wasn't the same player either because you could say, okay, X player had an off day, but it was a collective kind of thing. Um, but yeah, back back to the because I don't want to deviate from your question. It's kind of hard to say. I I think um, I think not being able to consistently field the players you want to field has definitely been been an issue. Because you see someone like Bodeak, obviously he had the injury, he came back, but I think he's still regaining that that you know that top level match sharpness. And obviously, I'm not putting all of the blame on on him, but the that case of having players coming back, having players rested, having players at different wa- wavelengths. But I mean, that being said, for example, I, I mean, I said for Abolon when they lost against you guys that it didn't, it wasn't worrying because the performance was encouraging. Whereas there were wins. For Omonia earlier in the season, that weren't as encouraging as the loss against Doxa. I mean, I know it's, I know it's, uh, you know, in Cyprus they say like it's, <laughs> you say you say you, you say that to a sick person to make them feel better, but I mean it's true because um, if you remember there was an episode, I think six seven rounds ago, where I was saying that Omonia was quite disjointed between the lines, that uh, Sheba was isolated a lot of the time, especially when, when Babu Liz was missing as well or when he was coming off the bench. Like you could see a, a, a big distance between the defense midfield and the attack. Against Doxa, at least there was, the shape was better. There was more, more cohesion. There was off the ball movement to at least find the chances to, to waste them down the line. So if, if, if you want to look at it from a, from an optimistic standpoint, at least there's that. And you hope that, you know, um, I mean, this is not my, my, uh, my notion or my term, but uh, with the, you know, with the advent of expected goals, um, if it's, you know, if a team is underperforming the, their expected goals, they're expected to, to regress to the mean, meaning the, 
they'll gradually score more goals and vice versa. If they're overperforming, so if they're expected to score a goal and they've been scoring three uh, every game because of amazing finishing or some other kind of circumstance. So if Omonia continue creating like this, it stands to reason that at some point the finishing is going to match the chances. So, but yeah, but I mean, the in terms of the defense, I mean, come on, it was a Lesiak brain fart. It was a, okay, you can lose the ball and by, by all means lose it. But to then also in the same passage of play to also concede a very needless penalty because I think Balde, who I'm actually a fan of, He's been one of Doxas's bright spots. He scored a really, really good goal against Abuel. If I'm not mistaken, and I might be, so I'm, I'm not going to say this uh, 100% certain, I think he's left-footed. So he was going down the right wing. Why would you... He was on his right foot. Why yeah. would you not... At least, okay, let, let him cross it with his weaker foot or let him yeah. cut inside where you are waiting. You know, stand him off, basically. Um not sure and why there's four, he... and there's four defenders in the box and one center forward. Now, yeah, what was that? So yeah. he's only going to aim for one person. Yeah, I think he panicked there, Lesiak, which is rare for him to do. Mm. The other thing that frustrated me most about this is that um, the, the lack of communication. If he's got someone telling him, doesn't matter, just track him, but don't don't touch him because we've got it, we've got it covered. Then the guy gets the ball to the byline, he pulls it back, you deal with it. But no one gave him a shot. And I think that's one of my main concerns from this season. There's no organisation defensively. And I know having spoken to certain people that Lufner was the guy that did the talking. Uh, Lang, as good as he is, he doesn't talk. Hubachan, as experienced as he is, he doesn't talk. And that's got to be a concern. I said to Roy in, in January, with the guy's contract coming up at the end of the season, go for Sambinha. Uh, Olympia goes because I think he can organise and I think he's solid defensively. But then again, you need someone long term. I don't know, but anyway, it is what it is. It is what it is. It's a, it's a big loss for Ammonia, but Ael is on the horizon. Let's see if there's going to be a a different performance. And speaking of Ael, Kiri, they got a very good victory at home against Olympia goes. They almost gave away a penalty in the opening two minutes. A cross into the box hit Teixeira's arm. Referee originally gave a penalty, went to VAR, decided to give it as a corner. I don't know. I've seen them given. That seems to be my my um, my tagline <laughs> in, on this uh, podcast. You know, I've seen them given and I've seen them given. But a lot of controversy in this one because Donaides, the Olympiagos chairman, came out to complain about this goal from Ael, saying that the lines were wavy. The VAR lines were wavy. And um, when you see them again, you can kind of understand his point now this one is actually going to the ethics committee because he's got his um I'll, I'll, let me pause it here he's got his uh lawyers involved in this one now that i don't know about this one man i don't know is it a toe that's putting him on side I, I i don't know um first of all what do you make of this and secondly before i press play and continue with the rest of the goals can you elaborate on what's happened with the, <laughs> with the the uh lawsuits because i know i have even got involved because they're unhappy with some decisions in in this game yeah i mean okay firstly uh shout out tornaridis he's always amazing value for post-match <laughs> comments whatever happens uh so he, he he's he's always good for a talking point for for the for for journalists and and fans so yeah uh, so I, i'll read it verbatim okay i'm translating from greek on the spot but uh, Don, the Olympiagos chairman said, I have given instructions to our lawyer to, pr to proceed with a formal complaint to the ethics committee for manipulating, for, for match manipulation through the VAR officials. And we are asked for the, for the VAR checks to be redone. To, so basically for the, for, the, uh, for the highlights to be rechecked by, by experts to determine where the lines should be placed. Um, he goes on to say, the whole story is not too far from forgery, which is a serious, <laughs> a serious offense. Uh, we are waiting for our uh, legal counsel to provide us with a formal opinion. 
And if we can go to the police for the same reason, what is certain is that these lines in the first in the first case and in the second case are clearly offside, and we don't know if they even used lines at all. <laughs> 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 oh, he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. What, what would yeah. you make of this, Kim? What do you make of all of this? Is um, the, uh, hmm. I have to say, I mean, I, I I think we had an incident like this earlier in the season in the first few rounds. And honestly, it's really difficult for for us to say. I mean, we're not the VR officials. We don't have, you know, their all of the angles that they have. And obviously, we're going by their lines. So as much as I can zoom into what they provided, I'm I'm still relying on the images that they provided and the lines that they placed. So in in Tornaridi's screenshot, he zoomed in the way they did in the 80s movies where the where, where the protagonist goes and haunts and haunts and it keeps going in <laughs> like Blade Runner. And and he 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 put a caption where he said that they've manipulated the Olympiagos defender's shoe to elongate it to make it seem like it's longer. But again, <laughs> I'm now I'm going by Dornarides's picture. <laughs> so it, you have to laugh. I mean, I I don't know. It's, it's, it's brilliant. It's legendary. <laughs> it's absolutely legendary. And I, I, look, I, I'm just raising. I'm. I'm honestly. I'm. I'm raising my hands. <laughs> you don't know what to say about anything like this, do you? It's, it's a. Yeah, it's it's going to uh, you know wrangle on for a long time. And you know, Shepovich gave Ayel a, a second goal, his first goal since the opening day against Buffalo. And then a penalty, which I don't think Donaidis can really complain about. He's gone right through the man. <laughs> penalty given. Shepovich scored his second goal of the game, his fourth of the season. And a very, very, very needed victory for uh, Bandelidis. Mm. Because I think their last victory was... No, I, I think... Or something. Yeah. No, I was going to say... Um... Uh, officiating aside, I did look good value for the, you know, for, for their win. Uh, um, they did create chances. Obviously, Olympiagos weren't at their best. I have to say, they, they were. I mean, even if you assume that, um, you know, that first one was offside, there's there's absolute acres of space behind Olympiagos defensive line between between their line and the keeper. So. I did exploit that space behind the Olympiagos defensive line a, a few times. But that that second goal, I mean, good finish, good cross, very soft for me. You just, first of all, you're watching the the, the man with the ball take all the time in the world to, to you know, to, to weigh his cross. And then, and then to let it just float in front of the, the goal mouth is just, just not good enough, to be honest. It's suicidal defending, and it, it happens a lot in this league. Now, I don't know whether it's got to do with the quality of the player or the intelligence of the player, but it's almost as if when you're a central defender, there aren't that many commanding central defenders in this league. Even the experienced mm -hmm. ones that are international players, like your Langs, they make the same uh, mistake. You got, exactly. I, I, I didn't mention with them... Um, Voxas' first goal, if you watch it again, when the ball is prodded to Sadiq by uh, Lesiak's, Lang is actually facing his own goal. And again, you're thinking, what is this? But look, Olympiacos have been brilliant this season. They've been punching above their weight, no doubt. Um, but this is a, a big victory for, for Ael, especially for, for their confidence. I think it was uh, seven, eight games without a win going into this one. And um, I mentioned it on the last podcast I did on my own that you know, Bandelid has got a very, very big job. And I think from a, a tactical side, they were brilliant. They played a 4-1-4-1. They were pressing with five men. Um, whenever Olympia Goss had the ball across their back line, they forced them into making mistakes. They got the ball out wide. And um, with Omonia coming up tomorrow, I think, it's going to be a, a, a bit of a feisty game, I think, anyway.
Yeah, f yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, because so, so, um, you mentioned, let me just see the... Yeah, um, sorry, you, you mentioned... <laughs> Sorry, yeah, sorry, you mentioned Paphos, right? No. No, 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 no. I mentioned... Uh, sorry, because you mentioned Ayl. Ammonia's next game. Against Ayl tomorrow. It's the, it's the game in hand, oh, the rearranged game. It's the, yeah, yeah, sorry. I was uh, I went to round 15. Um, right. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, unlucky for you that you're not finding Ayl under Getkes, you know, with uh, mm -hmm. a lot of dis disarray behind the scenes from from what has been making the rounds in terms of uh, rumours, at, at, at least, of disgruntled players and not a lot of um, togetherness, let's say, behind the mm -hmm. scenes. Uh, but yeah, it, it'll be interesting. I, I'm curious to see because it's uh, on, on one, um, sorry, IL on the ascendancy a little bit. And also Monia, I think, I don't know, it, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one to find um, um, a favorite. I don't think there is one, actually. And I, I think that's the case for for most of the games this season, to be to be honest. But, mm -hmm. I mean, in this instance, they are, uh, how many points? 15. Not too far behind you with one game exactly, yeah. um, extra. So, yeah, it's a very tight situation. Yeah, and no I don't know, how do you, how do you see it? Well, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be very difficult. When you've got a team that's lost seven or eight on the bounce or haven't won in seven or eight games and they get a good victory against a stout Olympia Goz, let's, let's not make any bones about it. You know, their tails will be up. They'll, they'd have seen our defeat against Oxford, the way that we defended. I know they're going to be physical against us. Um, and as I said, Uzoho's not playing because he wasn't with us when the game was supposed to be played, it was meant to be the opening game of the season. And he wasn't registered with us because he was still at Abuel. So with yeah. uh, Fabi injured and Uzoha out, it's going to be um, uh, Banayi in goal, which I don't have any problems with because he's an experienced goalkeeper. But, you know, he's, he's only played once this season. That was against Ethne Goz, the 2-0. So, anyway, it is what it is. It is what yeah, it is. And, and, and Uzoha has had a... Uzo, I was going to say about Uzoho earlier, um, he's had a good season. I, I think mm. you, you can argue that he's rebuilding his confidence this uh, season after a while, after a long while. Well, he had that big injury, didn't he, when he when he joined us? And then he left and went to Abuel because uh, Deportivo released him because they couldn't afford him. And he had a, a year, year and a half there, and he didn't really get many opportunities. Um, losing goal for him last season. Who's in goal for? I keep forgetting who's in goal for Abuel last season. I forget. He didn't play most of their games, did he? Who's in goal for him last season? Mm -hmm. Mihail was on loan at I can't. I can't remember who's in goal for Abuel right. last season. Um... Oh my goodness, it's going to go out of my head now. This is ridiculous. <laughs> I can't. Um, uh... <laughs> I, I need to know if you're watching live. Please. I'm actually no, didn't yeah, Silva, eh? Miguel Silva. Silva, that's right, that's right. Yeah, Miguel Silva, yeah. The, so, the very unconvincing. Mm, oh yes, oh yes, yeah, oh yeah. How could I forget him? But yeah, Uzo is going to be going yeah. to Afcon, which is going to be a, a big loss for us. But then again, Fabi might be ready for then. So, all right, it is what it is. But um. Mate, let's, let's move on to the next one. Speaking of AFCON, there's a guy here that scored twice for Nrothosi in their victory over Ethnigoz. It's Amir Vada. I think that's his second, seventh goal, sixth and seventh goal of the season. Where this club would be in the league without him, I don't know. It's something I say every single week. This guy is carrying them, absolutely carrying them. Yeah. But he's not going to be. He's not going to be going to AFCON, apparently, because he isn't even in the provisional squad. Two fantastic uh, I... goals, though. I think uh, it's the one instance where uh, poor off the pitch discipline actually benefits the club. Yeah. Because he ob ob he's obviously skilled enough to to feature for Egypt, but yeah, for for off the pitch reasons, he's been left out. Uh, but 
Yeah, what a player. Uh, especially these last few rounds. Uh, he's he, He's been looking sharper and sharper and sharper. I mean, him... Uh, him and Lazaros, like Lazaros on the on the set pieces, and Wada uh, running into space, has been. I mean, it's it looks so obvious now um, that he is kind of like solving Anorthosi's centre forward problems. But um, yeah, Wada is a, I guess, a second striker type, or, or like a, a hidden kind of striker thingy. It's really working out. I mean, the 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 second goal is it the the free kick was was the first goal. That's right, yeah. right. Yeah, the second goal was the one that I really liked because it's really easy for a player to find themselves there, take a touch, try to you know see whether how the keeper reacts and try to place it, but you can you can see how confident he is. He just immediately curled it around him. Uh, didn't really give the keeper any time to 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 come out. Okay, the, the first one, the keeper is in no man's land a little bit. But um, mm. yeah, the, the second one, I, I I really like the way he he just like curled it around the keeper. Okay, not sure about the dance. Christopher's but, ball, uh, though. Christopher's I'm, ball, though, was inch perfect. The perfectly weighted. His ball was yeah. brilliant to him. Yeah, really, really good pass from from Christophe. But um, yeah, it just looks like he. And I think was it the previous game that Warda ran to get Spaya and, and hugged him, or maybe two games ago. So there seems to be some. There seems to be a good relationship between the two. There, I think uh, Warda is appreciating how Getspaya is allowing him to play and again rebuild his confidence in in Cyprus. After being, you know, quasi ostracized in in uh, in Greece. Well, well, this is it. As you said, he's a quality player, and while he is a bit of a nutcase, gets by is doing the right thing in just letting him express himself on the field. Because you can't give a player like Vada instructions, specific instructions, because he can create off the ball, he can create on the ball, he could play left. Well, right, he can drift in. He's got so much ability. Um, and he's only 28 as well. Um, and as we've seen this season, his return has been fantastic. To come on a free transfer, and I hear they're going to offer him a new contract, and they need to give him whatever he wants. Let's not make any uh, mistake about this, mate. Without him, they would be seriously in trouble. I know they've got other players, but they haven't got a striker. And I imagine if they had a striker that could score goals. It's interesting. You know. It's interesting. It'll be very interesting to see in January what they do in, in the in the transfer window, because they they're not okay. I mean, I say this: they have one game in hand. If they win, they go to twenty two points, seven off the top. I know it sounds like a lot, but this is you know Cyprus. These mm. these deficits don't really mean much this early in the window. The, haven't they sent back the other um, Georgian fella who was on loan from Bark? Forget his name. He joined him in, uh, in the summer on loan. You're not talking about Gacharava. No, no, no. Gacharava's a striker, isn't he? But they yeah. said back, um, they said they had the player on loan from Bark, a Georgian player. And I forget his I forget uh, with an N. Uh, yeah. Um, you know what I'm talking about. I, I, I hope yeah, you know yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm and, trying um, to he was he was on loan. What? In the, he joined on loan in the summer, I think, and they sent him back. Is it Nimoa? Yes, Nima. that's the one, yeah. That's the one. And he's gone back to Bark. The thing is, that frees up another space for a non Cypriot, doesn't it? And with Lafferty's contract being being cancelled, that's another one. So they can effectively bring in two yeah. non Cypriots. And I'm sure one of them, apparently, they're looking to sign a, a striker from Turkey who's a, who's a Serbian striker. I forget his name. Is another. I should have really done my Googles, in all fairness, or done my research. But I was reading it yesterday on 24 Sport, and they were looking to bring in this, uh, this centre-forward um, from Turkey. What's his name? Hang about. He plays for um, Ozegovic. Ozegovic. He's mm -hmm. at Adana Spor. Um, big striker. 
big and burly striker, very similar to Cole Lafferty, really. Uh, very physical. So that you know, that's the kind of striker gets that, by that likes, <laughs> gets by your likes his target man, doesn't he? Mm, he likes it rough. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, look, on to the next game, mate. And it's your boys, Abolon against Abuel. One all draw. This game reminded me of a 1980s England, in, game in England and the 70s because there were players being kicked all over the place. It was physical. Abuel were really getting stuck in it. I'm not going to lie to you. I was very impressed with the way that they set their stall up. But before I show the highlights of this game, would you like to uh, brief our listeners and viewers on the referee and the controversy surrounding his um, selection, shall we say? Yeah. So, so before the game, obviously the you know the the football association announces the the refs for each game. Obviously, you have certain teams who protest against the appointment of certain refs. Sometimes it's posturing. Sometimes they you know there might have been a bad game from the season before or the previous round, you know, these things, these things happen. In this case, uh, a picture that was making the rounds was of the uh, referee uh, during his younger days, uh, you know, amongst the Abuel fans, you know, the Deporto Cali, you know, clad in orange. And it was, it was an interesting selection, you know, when you know that the, the I mean, the ref is a certified Aboyle fan and they're putting him in a derby. You know, you you it, you it can't help but feel cynical about it, especially in a, in a league like uh, Cyprus. Now, I'm, I'm, even if you look at it with the most um, kind of like innocent, good-willed way, you know, it does charge the game with this sort of energy a little bit. Uh, granted, I, I, you know, I think I, at least on my end, I try to keep an open mind. But <laughs> uh, I think some suspicions were kind of like confirmed. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess we can talk about it after we watch the highlights um, yes, if you let's, want. Let's go. Let's go. And... Um... To be fair, mate, I think, as I mentioned before, with Upwell, they were very physical, got stuck in, but you guys played your game as best as you possibly could. Scoffet wasn't threatened as much, but Upwell are very, very dangerous, especially from set pieces and from range. You'll notice this season, like, Nadell is very good at shooting from far. They're quite um, threatening from corner kicks and, and uh, free kicks, as we're just about to see. Garo has been in immense form. He's the guy that got the equaliser, but we'll speak about him in, in just a moment, but Darbo gave you guys the lead with an utter worldie. That's got to be up there for contender as goal of the season because the way that the ball fell to him, the way that he brought it down, the way that he finished it. I mean, listen, he's 34 years old. I know he's got his new contract now, which I believe he signed yesterday. We spoke about him at great length the last time we did a show together. And um, yeah, we said he didn't score enough goals, but this one here is great take, great second touch. And even the third touch before setting himself up, absolutely smashed it. No chance for the goalkeeper. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I cannot fault Dabo for work rate uh, and for, you know, trying to make things happen. Obviously, the manager favors him um he he does things that the manager wants um i mean that was probably Dabo's best goal since he joined abolon he dropped off a little bit in the second half his some of his first touches uh kind of let him down a little bit but like i said i mean this is kind of like uh this this is the player and i i accept that this is his Profile. Uh, it's kind of mm -hmm. hard to to say. Um, can make the absolute brilliant happen, but yeah, I mean, if he was, you know, if he didn't have these these little flaws in his game, obviously he wouldn't have been in Cyprus, would he? <laughs> um, no, there you go. There but you yeah, go. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, overall, the the one one isn't the most unfair score scoreline. Um, it's just the way it got there. 
that that might have grated uh, our Bordelon fans mostly, um, especially after going ahead in the, in the first half. Yeah, that was a really a good shot by Cole. Um, mm. That was one of the good school fair saves from from this uh, season. Yeah, um, yeah. It was a very it was a very it was a very entertaining game, mate. And you know, both t both teams had some great opportunities. As you saw, that Devicenti should have scored, or at least played the lovely ball there. But you know, it wasn't um, one way traffic. It was like a, a basketball game. You know, both sides. Uh, showing some attacking intent. And as you mentioned with um, Darbo's first touch, and there's an opportunity here where there's a possible penalty claim, but I think that would have been a very soft penalty to to give, in all fairness. Um, I think the referee got that one spot on. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. What, what did you make of that? Foul or no? I, th I think... It, I know it's a, it's, um, a bit of an infuriating uh, line, but it's one of those... If if it was in the middle of the park, it would have been a hundred percent a foul. But mm. you, but in the area, you, it, it's not. Uh, yeah. yeah. Does that does that make sense? I, I yeah, think the absolutely. ref would have given it if it was if it was a foul. Um, but yeah, no, I think that that doesn't even go in the top ten uh, most egregious or at least divisive <laughs> decisions in the game. Well, uh, we just saw that but, chance. I mean, we just saw it. Sorry, Karen. No, I was going to say, actually, I was a bit annoyed there because I, I wanted Dabo to take the shot or at least right. not, hold, not hold it. He, I think he hold, it, uh, hold the ball on too much there. Either go for it, take the shot, or cut inside for the, for the pass. Uh, I think he, he misjudged the, the situation. Sorry, you were going to say something. No, he, he seems... The thing is, the, there, are, there are a lot of strikers out there that act on instinct. And he seems to be one of those strikers whereby if you give him time to think, he fluffs his lines. But if you give him one or two seconds, he'll bury it. If you look at the, the goal, for example, he, he only had time to take two or three touches before smashing it in. That was instinctive. Whereas this opportunity, he's running onto it. He's had three or four seconds, five seconds on the ball. He's running on it. He's running into the box. He's probably thinking, Nadev's caught up with me. What am I going to do? He's, he's panicked. Whereas if he, 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 I don't know, maybe he had two or three seconds on the ball inside the box, he probably would have, would have smashed at it or levered it, you know, or at least mm. tried to, to, to yeah. shoot on goal. But um, I guess you guys must be frustrated with the way that he conceded the equaliser because the goalkeeper made a fantastic save and straight from the corner, um, they've, they've pulled level and poor defending and how you can let Garo inside the box with so much space, no one marking him. The goalkeeper flapped at it as far as I'm concerned. He should have punched it further or at least tried to catch it. But Garo, for me this season, he's been absolutely immense for him. Um, he scored some very, very important goals. He's a leader. And I hate to admit this as an Omonia fan, but I actually like him. I, I don't I don't have any problems with him. Does that make sense? So the fact that he plays for them, I should really hate him. But as a player, I think he's brilliant. And he's obviously improved Abuel. And he scored more goals than Vilidaya this season. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, he yeah, he's been a great addition uh, at the back and at the front. But, yeah, I mean, after the – there was a few incidents of, of a very uh, – overzealous shirt pulling the other day. So maybe he dropped a little bit on my likability scale than, than, it, than it does on yours. But, I'll come uh, in shit housing. That's, no, that's what you got to do, man. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I, exactly. I mean, he's a centre back. So, but um, no, I was going to say that goal was particularly annoying because I was talking with an IL fan the day before the game and he was going on and on about Jovanovic, best keeper in the league, best keeper that, best keeper this. I'm like, ah, oh. it was, yeah, it was a very, very poor uh, intervention there. I mean, you just, if you're going to flap it like that, at least flap it kind of like a, away from the area, like towards mm -hmm. the touchline or at least for a corner or something. But he basically set them up for, for a second cross and it was disappointing to see. I mean, I'm not making excuses for the other ones for letting Garo um, kind of like at the back post by himself. 
but it, but it was a bit difficult after your own keeper comes out and he, you know, he kind of scuffs the, the punch. Yeah. It's not, not what you wanted. And, um, Look, uh, as I said, it was a very feisty game and Abo were very threatening, especially from set pieces. But there was one moment whereby you guys had, uh, this is the first touch that we were talking about, I think that's the one that you mentioned, where he, he completely fluffed his lines, Dabo. Um, but from the corner, the counter-attack, and this has got a lot of people talking, especially on our Twitter page, because, you know, for me... Didn't look like a yellow card. It's a second yellow. It's a it's a red card. I don't know. What did you make of this? Because you and I were, were discussing this when um, when it happened. And I said, he's, he just stood his ground. And yet, it, when you look at it again, it doesn't look like he goes over the ball. But in all fairness, he, he's kind of stood his ground. And uh, people have been sending me stills of his right foot stepping on Nadal. And they're like, oh, no, it should have been a straight red. But... I didn't see anything malicious, anything dodgy about that. And even to give him a second yellow, I don't know. I, I mean, don't know. I, I think um, within the context of the game, meaning the fouls that he allowed and the and the yellows that he didn't give well, far more uh, to, some play, to, to some players at least, to me, that's not a... That's not a the yellow card. Uh, I know the fact that it was a, a counter attack makes it seem even more severe than it is, because you know the assumption is that, that had he gone past him, he would have you know created a chance or whatever. I don't know. To me, it was to me it was not a yellow card. Uh, maybe it's my bias. I I, I accept it, but yeah, if you. If, if, do you think he got the yellow card because he turned away? Do you think that's what it is? When he went in for the chat, it because from the referee's view, this is what I'm trying to see it from like a third person perspective. Because I'm, I'm taking my own bias out the out the equation here, and I'm thinking about maybe where the referee was, w what he saw. Because if Filiodis, if he's seen Filiodis bring down the player, and the whole time Filiodis was facing that way and wasn't looking at the ball at all, maybe the referee thought, ah, he wasn't in control of the challenge. Um, Nadal was running at pace and obviously when you get clattered into at that pace you're going to go flying so maybe the referee made that initial reaction based on all of those factors that being said I, I, I agree with what you said in terms of the, the amount of fouls that were, that were made especially first half it was like the 70s and 80s in England like when George Best was getting smashed all over the place that's what it reminded me of I, yeah I, I'm, I'm sorry like um Okay, again, this might this is bias meets uh, meets removal of bias. Abolon released of Abolon, I think fans, Abolon fans rather, not not obviously not the club, yep. released a compilation of, of fouls and incidents from the game. It's about well, six you need minutes to send long. It to me. You need to send it to me. I need to see it again. <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh, I can't. I'll try to find it and, and send it to you. Um, obviously, you know there's captions, or it, each incident is put in a category with similar things, and some of them don't actually claim that it's one way or the other. But it's just like, um, could this have been given, or could this have not have been given? And okay, you can say that about half of it is. You know, it's biased because, okay, it's fans, you know, they get heated and obviously they'll think that the team is wronged. But one thing stood out was there was a, a category which was, um, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking out now. Uh, it's well defensive Cyprus, mate. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Um, Jesus, uh, Abuel midfield. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm blanking out. Uh, midfielder. Well, Souza. Uh, yeah, Souza. Oh my God, I was, I was, I was, for some reason the name Silva from the keeper we mentioned before kept. <laughs> oh, um, Where are we a nightmare today, mate? Where are we a nightmare? We're forgetting names, and everything. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. Um, anyway, the fact that Souza 
went through the game without a yellow card. If you see the, the challenges, it's, it's absolutely incredible. It, as in the actual meaning of the word incredible, meaning it cannot be credible, meaning it's unbelievable. <laughs> um, and yeah, and like I'm not saying uh, some of the Abolon yellows uh, shouldn't have been given. But Aboil should have had at least two more yellows, at least two more yellows, mm. uh, which changes the, the dynamic of the game. And also, like, I, I'm very curious. I just want to know wh what Sofronis is thinking. Because in the first half, yeah, okay, he set them up really well. He, uh, he set them up well. They pressed us really well, pressed us high, created chances. But also he was allowed to play a very aggressive uh, style of football. And I just wanted, and I just want to know how he, how it feels on the other end. Cause he's been on the other end of, of such, you know, um, performances, but obviously, you know, I don't think, I think he probably views it, views it as a, I'm a professional now. It doesn't matter where, where I played or where I managed or whatever, but, Anyway, I hope he enjoyed being able to play so aggressively with seemingly no punishment. <laughs> well, mate, I wanted to ask you about uh, Sofran because I didn't get the chance to, to ask you before or after the game. Um, do you think because of his relationship with the club, the two tenures he had and the way that it ended, do you think this was kind of like an added incentive for him to make it more physical, just to stick it to them, so to speak? Uh, n no, I, I, I wouldn't say I, I wouldn't make, I wouldn't make that connection because his style was always a bit physical, even at Abolon. If, if anything, <laughs> if anything was motivating him is the prospect of being sacked from Abuel. Do you think he's in danger? Uh, first and foremost, every Abuel manager is always in danger. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay. something... Something we didn't mention, two, I think it was two weeks ago, Pursaididis gave an interview in Greece. I don't know if you saw it. No, I didn't, no. no. Oh, he, he, he said some, some uh, lovely things. Uh, he basically said, I shouldn't have gone to Abuel. I should have listened to my friend's advice. They all told me, don't go to Abuel. They don't respect their managers. They don't, uh, they're not patient. But they paid for them, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, but he said, he said I should have listened to my to uh, advice I took from people. I shouldn't have gone there. Uh, he he quasi implied that this may have hurt his career, or that he had that he had other options, I guess, or whatever. And what did he say? He he elaborated a bit, a bit on this. He said he felt like he went into the season as a lame duck. He said they were looking for excuses to fire him. And he was he was explaining that because of the late transfers and the injuries, that he should that he said that he told the board or that or that the board should have realized, I, I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, that the true team would have shown its, you know, its real performances by the eighth or ninth round which is a right. fair thing to say, but obviously this is not the club that would have accepted that. It's either a running start or nothing. Yep. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if like, I'll make it I'll make it extreme. That uh, Sofronis takes them up to second and they fire him with three games to go. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised because, remember, gets by out was going to win the league, right, with the, with them. Mm -hmm. And he got fired five, six games for Sachas to, to win the league as, yep. a, as an interim. So, I don't know. Uh, yeah, and speaking of which, I don't know. Can they afford to fire Sofronis now? Because that's another, that's another uh, contract termination that they, they would need to compensate. And... Uh, I know we were talking about this uh, before the show. They are in trouble. Uh, I'm, I, there's a lot of stuff that has been floating around. 
allegedly about Abu Ayyub this season in terms of their finances, which made the summer transfer window really unexpected. I, I know me, you and Roy talked about this as well. 800 odd thousand in transfer fees and then also signing some expensive free agents like Okriashvili is probably on mm. good money. On uh, Sozai's on good money as well. So, and now they're saying, let, let me, because the, like I said, there's a lot of alleged things being said. So there, there, was, a, there was a shareholders, was it like a shareholders meeting yesterday? Or was it like yeah, a, a, a party and, and um, yeah, that, was the, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no, I was going to reference that because that's the only factual thing we know. Right. And we can, we can safely reference. Yeah. And sorry that I interrupted you. No, uh, no, no, that's fine. So I thought you were going to refer to the, the share thing with one of the sponsors. Uh, let me find it because I want to I want to I want to go line by line because I don't want to misquote. Yeah, there we go. So, yeah, multiple outlets uh, quoted Prodromos Petridis, the Abuel chairman. So it's a quote, right? So mm. this is during a sponsors, like an event for Abuel sponsors. So I, I see a, a picture of Petridis there. Uh, so I'm, I'm seeing CableNet, which recently signed a new agreement with them as well for, for other sports, not just for football. Uh, Stichiman, uh, Macron, and a few other sponsors that Abuel had. So it was a, an event specifically for the sponsors, which we don't know if, if it was used for fundraising purposes as well. Yeah. To ask for additional funds. We don't know that. But the quote is on. Oh, that Kiri, I've lost you. That in I've difficult. Lost you. I've lost you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Talk again. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, so let me, I'll start from the beginning. So he told sponsors, uh, on behalf of the Aboyal board, I would like to thank all of you for your support. Uh, you all know very well that in difficult times, every euro counts, like Tesco. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we would like to thank you uh, a lot. Uh, we are going through difficult or tough uh, financial times, although I can assure you that we will manage to pull through. And then he adds, month by month, day by day, we move forward, and I hope the team moves forward as well. End of the quote. Now, when you reach the point where you say, day by day, month by month, Again, we are, we are going through uh, conjecture and implications here. But when, when, when a chairman says day by day, month by month, that spells some really tough times for them. And I'm wondering, um, are they in danger of not being able to pay players on time when you say day by day month by month um, right. I, I will tell you something then, now from then on again this is a question this is not, it's not a statement uh, uh, Karen I know, I know there's a bit of a time delay when I'm when I'm talking to you so apologies if it, if it seems like I'm cutting you mate <laughs> sorry can't hear you hello Oh, I was just getting to the, the, the meaty part right here. Kerry, are you there? You can hear me? Yes? Maybe? Possibly? Ah, uh, see? This is where we're getting to the, the, the meaty part of the, the conversation. And um, I don't know if Kerry can still hear me, but... Um, when he was talking about the players and not being able to be paid on time, I can tell you for now, everyone watching, I have it on good authority that there is one particular player who left WL recently. I'm not going to say who, and I'm not going to say which country he's gone to, but he's still waiting to be paid for a few months of his last few months at the club. Still waiting to be paid. 
So that'll be um, an interesting one there. You right there, Kiri? Sorry, uh, I think I'm sorted now. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely fine, mate. Absolutely fine. Sorry. I no problem, no problem. I know it's a bit of a strange internet connection tonight for both of us, really. But I was just saying that I, I've heard it on good authority from a player who's no longer at the club, who left in the summer. I'm not going to say which country he's gone to or where he's, where he's playing now, but he still hasn't been play, paid for the, remate, the last few months of his time at the club, despite leaving. So they still owe money. And it's not unheard of in football because we hear about players leaving and still being owed money, but for it to be up well for their financial situation. And we've spoken about it at great length throughout the season about how we heard rumours, allegations that other clubs had helped them out financially, rumours that the Archbishop in Cyprus had helped out, rumours that the current political party in, in charge of the nation, of the, of the island, has helped out. Again, all allegations, but for them to have a fundraiser... Or, okay, sorry, for them to have a, a meeting or a networking event which could be described as a fundraiser at this time of year as well. I know you could say it's Christmas, it's the end of the year, but I don't know. It seems like a whip round to me. It, it's, it's tricky. I, like I said, there's a lot of uh, rumours floating around. Um and also, it's, it's an interesting, like I said, um, in the last week or two, they they signed an agreement with CableNet, which I didn't think of it much at the moment. But now I'm putting these two things together because the agreement is about basically every sport for which Upwell has uh, a team. So uh, Volleyball and... Exactly. Uh, volleyball, yeah. handball, swimming, athletics... Ping pong, so CableNet can now broadcast basically any sport uh, that Abuel plays in, and also, uh, you know, create other content for YouTube clips, mm. uh, documentaries, interviews, whatever. So I'm thinking, if this deal happened now, why now and not in the beginning of the season for each respective sport? Was it a case of? going to them and asking for more money or money in advance for broadcasting rights and then saying, we can't do that. You have to, this has to be a transaction. So you have to give us something for, for us to excuse the money that we can give you. Mm. Well, the one thing I will say, and a lot of clubs are doing this, and it's not just, not just uh, Abuel, but you know, Omonia do it as well. I want to show you this. This is their official website. And um, they've got a lot of partners, Sticky Mum, Macron, Cable, as I mentioned, but they've got Pizza Hut, they've got Nurofen, they've got a whole heap of them. They've even got Huawei, the, um, the mobile company that make telephones and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I guess that's how they're trying to generate more revenue as commercial partners like Ed Woodward at Man United so famously uh, did, you know, bringing in noodle partners or a mobile phone partner from Nigeria or Azerbaijan. I guess that's what, what most clubs are trying to do. Obviously, COVID has had an effect. The, the attendances are dwindling, especially now that they've brought in the new COVID measures, the new rules about needing to be double jabbed or whatever, and, and bringing in a PCR test, which you still have to pay for out there. Um, so I understand it's not just a in that situation, but as you said, what uh, what Bedridis was saying in the, in the statement about it being running day by day, it's got to be a cause for concern. Yeah, and like I said, it, it doesn't make sense with the transfer spending in the summer because it looks like Going for they broke? went... Sorry? Going for broke, Europe or nothing? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what, what, what it seems like they are attempting because I think if they qualify for a European competition and if they qualify to the group stage of that competition, even if it's the conference league or whatever, that is a huge help. But how, I mean, obviously that's not a sustainable or viable or safe way to, to go about decreasing your, you know, your, your debt. Cause obviously I think any up oil chairman, but especially Betridis is not going to come out and say, right, lads, the next five seasons, 
we're not going for it. We're not going for the league. We're going to cut back on transfers and wages until we bring our finances down in terms of debt. And then we're going to, you know, recoup or whatever. Because, uh, I mean, and that's a very separate way of, of doing things. And they're not the first club or the last club that's going to, I was going to do this, but obviously, if this season, I mean, let me just check again the 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 standings. Uh, seventh, one game in hand, seventeen points, and okay. So the and the first Europe, Europe two conference leagues, two Champions Leagues. And Europa League is through the cup, right? That's five, five positions in five European spots, which is huge. Uh, I think that's I think that's why he he was tempted to pursue this strategy this summer, because it's not like okay, it's two spots, maybe three. Um, I think he 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 liked his odds, yeah. but that that means you either have to win the cup or you have, I mean, Abolon, Ike are not moving from those top four positions. I think so something crazy needs to happen for that for that to take place. Aris looks very solid, and then you've got Bafos Anorthos Yomonia Apoel, who can on their day be anyone, and okay, a bit inconsistent as well. So I think it's basically uh, four clubs fighting for one spot. Yeah, and they've got uh, Olympia goes in the cup as well, which ain't going to be easy. No, but it's the cup, so I don't know. I don't know. It's it's that's a that's a bit more of a wild card, yeah. but um, yeah, it's going to be very tricky because you have to ask, you have to wonder what if what if it doesn't happen for them this season? What happens in the summer? Is it a clear out? Is it something something more serious? And from what I've heard. And they do have a Georgian con uh, constituency in, in the club now. Them Georgian players, they're not going to play unpaid, no. is what I've heard from people who experience them. And obviously, what player wants to play, you know, with deferred wages or whatever? Well, no one. Exactly. Pre precisely. So, the, yeah, it's uh, as we said before, it's uh, double or nothing. <laughs> and that's, that's how they're going to go. But... Let, let's see. We we know that there could be someone interested in buying the club in the background. We 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 never know. We never know. But put it this way: for the way the way that the uh, the voting system went back in the last season, with uh, Betelides being up against a uh, relative unknown, and for the the guy to pull out literally in the last minute, just tells you how much power the guy's got. But look, we've spoken about Abu at great length. Let's talk about the final game. Let's wrap this one up with Buffer. A fantastic win at Ayek. Last week, we were talking about Ayek. Well, I was talking about Ayek getting a great result against Omonia. A point gained because, obviously, you guys lost against Aris, and that was a massive point. Role reversal this time. You guys got a massive point at Abuel. And Ayek, who went a goal up uh, against Buffer in the opening 12 minutes, Sim Tandy with an uncharacteristic goal. I love Sim. He's a lovely guy. We speak quite regularly. In fact, he watched the No Chofters podcast after... We drew against Ike, but he scored a fantastic goal with his left foot. And the moment they took the lead on, on 12 minutes... Really thought, good goal. Yeah, really good goal. I thought, ah, they're going to go on to win this. But Buffer, within three minutes, pulled it level with um, Abdul Salamov's header. Then uh, Valakari made it 2-1, a player who's been absolutely immense for him this season. I think that was his seventh goal of the season. The guy who I believe has been linked with Bark, if I'm not mistaken. Again, I think this is the second time he's been... Linked with the, the move to Thessaloniki, he pulled them 2 1 up, which we're going to see in just a moment. But this again was a, a, similar to the Abuel Abolong game in the sense that it was like a game of basketball. Willie Sanyo did so well on the byline here, um, pulling it back. And there was Valakari to make it 2 1. I know Dumba probably would have liked to have done a lot better, but then um, they made it 3 1 through Panic. And that's 3 1 at the, the end of the first half. But I. They kept uh, plugging away, trying to get a goal. There was a Yusko with a chance, which he put over the bar. I think Matt Darbyshire also had a chance later on. But second half, 
was more of the same. A header that went wide. A lot of chances from out wide, really. And then an opportunity here for Valakari. Decided to uh, take it inside before smashing it over the bar. Um, but then Ike had the goal disallowed later on in the game, which I'm sure we're about to see where the ball's gone in the box and it was given offside. But we're just going to see that in just a moment. We see the, the half chance. Because so much happened. There, there was 10 minutes of highlights with this game and me chopping it up was going to be very, very difficult because <laughs> it's all yeah. half chances, you know, so apologies for anyone watching this thinking what's going on here. But I think we're about to see the, um, <clears throat> the disallowed goal for Ike. And even now watching it back and thinking about why it was given, I still can't put my finger on where the offside was. I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I don't know if you've seen it there, Kiri. Um, the actual uh, offside yeah. decision. I saw it, uh, and I have to say, I, I'm I'm still undecided. It was very, very tight. Was this um, a handball, by the way? Was this a handball in your eyes? Oh yeah, I forgot to mention this because we talked about a handball earlier in in the in the episode, which was very similar to this. And in the Greek commentary in, on Prime Tell, the guy says, "Well, he's trying to pull it back," but. <laughs> The question is, it's not whether he... I mean, I know he's trying to uh, stick it close to his body, but I think it's not about the intention, right? It, it does hit his arm. And, yeah. and it's not as if it was like directly at him. It wasn't smashed at him. It's crossed into the box. His arm was out, and he's pulled it back in at the last second. But that's a penalty all day, as far as I'm concerned. But this is the offside. What, 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 what happened here? Because looking at it, I didn't see anything wrong with it. I honestly didn't see anything wrong with it. No, it's the head. It's the head. It's this part. No, how is he offside? Th that's that's where. Well, that's what they said anyway. That that's where the offside is. The the player in the back post. He's offside. I'm I'm, I'm sorry for getting really close up to the screen, but I can't. Where's the offside there? It, if you look at it later, that that's what they're claiming. But I honestly can't tell. Again, I, I genuinely can't tell from... But VAR says that the scorer was an offside after the flick, after the, the flick. After the flick, after let, the flick me, let me pull it back. Let me pull it back to where the lines are. Because they put the lines... Yeah. I still can't make head nor tail. How? Okay, so the red line is the player, right? But he yeah. doesn't look offside because it looks like this player here, the one to his left, is playing him yeah. on. The, the the there's a tall centre back. I can't remember which one it is. Um, that's the one that I thought was covering him, but apparently the the scorer's right foot is further than the defender's. Uh, uh, so right it's just knee. like it's just like the Olympiagos game, just like the the I Olympiagos game. Uh, yeah, but uh, I don't. I'm not sure if I did. I complain about this. I pff, pass. I don't know. I don't yeah, think they I do. Haven't, but I haven't seen anything. But um, it, no, it's, it, for me, it's bizarre. I, I don't. I don't. I didn't see. It. I don't see an offside there. I really don't. Maybe it's just my vision, but I, I don't see it. Even the line looks too long. It looks too. The, sorry, the two lines look too far apart for it to. At least with the IL game, the lines were right on each other, so you could say, "All right, it was it was marginal," but um, I can't I can't see where it where it was. I, I really can't see it. But in terms of the, the game overall, because obviously we've gone on for for an hour and fifteen minutes, mate, and um, you have to go, I have to go. Um, Buffer was celebrating very uh, proudly, as you'd expect, and I, I showed you the the tweet. And the, the footage from after the game, the fans outside in, in Buffalo in the streets celebrating. Okay, it's a massive win, don't get me wrong. But titles aren't decided in December. What is this 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 infatuation with saying that we won the league or that we're going to win the league or we're close to winning? Because I just did it last week. Buffalo did it. Are we, are we talking about fans who are getting overexcited because their team has, has overperformed this season? Um. Well, the, the thing is, because the league is so competitive this season, um, a, a win really, like a, a win really, uh, is is really reflected in the table pretty much in almost instantly. So, and also with Buffalo's, right? Remember, they they at some point, I think in five games, they had two draws, two losses, one win, and then in the last. Uh, five games, three wins, two draws. 
So their form it has really changed because in the beginning of the season, they didn't start well. So I don't know, maybe it's the momentum building up. And it, uh, I mean, beating, I mean, you, they did beat the, the team that uh, led the league, I think, for the most time up to now. So maybe they felt like it was a statement win for them. I was very impressed with Buffer defensively, especially when the ball was played out wide for Ike, because Ike had got some big guys in the box and the delivery is always fantastic, more often than not anyway. And the way that Buffalo held their line, the way that they had four men, and it was man for man defending. If you watch the highlights again, whenever the ball was in the box, it wasn't ball watching. It was solid. It was compact. As I said, it was man for man. They dealt with everything. Very Even the goalkeeper, Rudko, was, was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So I think they deserved the victory on the counter-attack. They were dangerous. They were, do you know what? They're, they're probably one of the best teams in the league from, in terms of a counter-attacking um, style. What do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, if if uh, if anything, there are times that I'm like slow it down. <laughs> like I think, like I think Semedo had a couple of promising, like he had the ball in a couple of promising situations, and he went for the shot for the like for the quick for the quick shot um, where he may maybe he should have passed. But who am I to you know who am I to say? Because they they scored three times, they created chances. So yeah, no. Really good. I I like uh, Abdul Salamov. Uh, mm-hmm. He he gives me UFC vibes. Like like he would <laughs> like he would you know put someone in a chokehold uh, a little bit. But he's only uh, he, eighteen he as well, man. He's only eighteen. Is he really? Yeah. Only okay. That, years old. Well, we, we did say that Buffalo's wants to buy players that have resale value. Oh shit! Eighteen years old. Damn. Yep. I didn't. Know, yep. I, I don't know how this has evaded me. He came from literally nowhere. He was playing like a second division Russian team, I think. He wasn't. Yeah. And to be fair, man, like if you look at them, look last season. You know, we did, obviously weren't doing this podcast, but we're talking about VAR being such a vital player for him. He's not in the, even in the squad because he's gone AWOL. And as far as I'm aware, there's some legal issues happening, but they've. They've signed some really, really good players this summer, man. Like, uh, all right, they've plucked them out of obscurity. Like, you know, um, what's his name? Uh, Semedo. Semedo. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic football. I think, didn't he come from Grenoble in France on a free transfer? Um, they've re-signed Punchin on a new contract, which is a, a, a great move for him. I think Hotscore has been brilliant for him this season. Came from Muscron. Um They've made some really, really good signs, and and Kvita as well, the central defender yeah. from the Czech Republic. Um, that I think this, I think this is, is this his first season as well? I think he's signed from Nijmegen. So these are this is a their 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 scouting has been absolutely fantastic. I, I can't I can't fault them. And while in the background, yeah, they've they've made some questionable decisions. In terms of sacking managers, we spoke about Stephen Constantine coming in as technical director and then whatever happened and Cameron Toshak, whatever. But this is a a squad, a a club with, I wouldn't say a a vision per se, because we spoke about it earlier on in the season about how we don't know where they're going or what they're doing. But while the results are, are good, while the performances are good, we can't argue that it's working. If that makes sense. You know how we talk like people talk about Chelsea constantly sacking managers, but they keep winning league titles or being successful. Buffer, they've got this weird structure, but for the moment, it's working. Yep. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think it backfired at certain times, mm. um, like during the the last years. They they go on these little clusters of of wins. Buffers, like you think they're gonna. Like at times you think they're going to walk the league, like okay, obviously I'm exaggerating, but mm. you know they have these spells where they do really really well, um, like the season bef- uh, before this one and the season before that, and then they they drop off a little bit or they, a few draws stack up, and then okay you you dismiss them again, and then back you know the the back again, so if they can find a bit more consistency or at least. I'm not saying to win every game. Obviously, it's, it's uh, easier said than done. But if some of those marginal losses can become marginal draws, it makes a world of difference because you maintain your confidence a bit more. You get the point. 
um, it just looks, it just can provide a solid basis for something even better. I mean, think about how much, uh, how effusive people have been for Aris. And there are only six points ahead of Paphos, who know not a lot of people have been talking about in such glowing terms. Obviously, Aris is a bit more of a surprise. Uh, but yeah. Brilliant. Well, let me just quickly bring up the league table before we wrap it up. I had it here a minute ago. I don't know where it's gone. See, it's just been one of those days, Kiri. It's been one of those days where yeah. everything is, is, is just topsy-turvy. I found it. Here we go. Let's have a look. Share screen. It's a beauty of this. Here we go. The league table. Abolon. Top of the tree, mate. Going into Christmas with 29 points. Um, Ayak down to second on 28. Aris remaining third and 27. Then you've got Buffo moving up to uh, fourth. Anorthosi, massive leapfrog after their victory. Omonia slipped down to sixth following defeat. But they have a game in hand against Ael. Hopefully we can get that win and move up to fifth. Um, then it's <laughs> Abuel next for Omonia on Boxing Day. So effectively Omonia could stay in fourth if they win their next two games. Um, Olympia will slip out of the top six to eighth. Ael stay in ninth after their winning. After their winning. After their win. Doxa hot on their tails on 14 points. Bayek, 11th on 12 points. And Ethnigos on 8 points. So that's another episode of This Is Mapa Done. We've gone for an hour and 20 minutes, which is probably the longest show we've done. Thank you, Abuel, for giving us enough content. Yeah. <laughs> enough things to talk about. <laughs> God, imagine if Roy was here. This would be a three-hour show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Kiri, thank you again for your time, mate. Before I let you go, Thanks. have you got anything you'd like to promote? Any social media, anything like that? Uh, no. Uh, you guys can see my hat on, on Twitter. I'm there. Uh, ask me something or tell me I'm wrong about something. It's all good. Uh, yeah. Uh, you guys have a nice week, whoever is listening and watching out there. And have a nice Christmas. And hopefully when we come back, we can actually get around to talking about the kid that got fined 100 euros for a handball. Oh, my day. Off. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that on the next episode. So that's it for another edition of This Is Mapa. We'll be back in the new year with more stories and more shenanigans. And knowing Cyprus, a lot will probably happen between now and the next time we do the show. So until next time, take care.